Paris, June 1995. Le Bourget Airport, opening day at the 41st International Aero Salon. A prodigious spectacle, attracting over 1,500 exhibitors and more than 200 aircraft. Staged every two years, the world's largest aviation fair is a mecca for experts and enthusiasts, keen to view the latest developments in the field. It's also the ideal platform for manufacturers to present their aircraft to the general public for the first time. As the showcase for state-of-the-art technology, the Aerosalon sets the future standards for the entire aviation industry. A case in point was the unveiling of two highly innovative helicopters. The Bell Boeing V-22 Osprey, a hybrid between a helicopter and an airplane. And the MD-900 Explorer, built by McDonnell Douglas, in which the conventional tail rotor has been replaced by a jet propulsion nozzle. Exciting new developments were also on display in the military sector. These included the B-2 bomber, built by Northrop Grumman, whose unique shape and exterior coating render it virtually undetectable by radar. A further highlight was the presentation of the X-31, a joint German-American experimental project, which demonstrates the exceptional capabilities of so-called thrust vector technology. However, one of the real stars of the show was the Boeing 777, the world's largest twin-engine jet, which went on public display for the first time. And many visitors eagerly grasped the chance to get to know this exciting newcomer firsthand. Viewed from a distance, the Boeing 777, as it's called in the United States, does not appear to be impressively large or markedly different from any other twin-engine jet. In fact, however, the jetliner is bigger than all other two-engine planes, measuring 240 feet in length and boasting a wingspan of nearly 200 feet. Among the 777's many novel features is its six-wheeled main landing gear. This makes it unique among passenger airplanes, apart from the Tupolev 154 which in all other respects bears greater similarity to the Boeing 727. Equally impressive are the massive engines, which depending on the version, can measure more than 10 feet in diameter. This machine, which was supplied to United Airlines, has been fitted with Pratt & Whitney PW4084 engines, whose more than 90,000 pounds thrust set new standards of performance. No other commercial airplane requires such powerful engines. While Boeing took advantage of the opportunity to show off its new plane to the public, the first Boeing 777s were already being used by a commercial carrier. On June 7, 1995, four days prior to its official launch at the Paris Sphere, the first 777 was put into service by United Airlines. During one of its first scheduled flights in regular service, we took the opportunity to find out whether the 777 can really live up to the star billing it received at Le Bourget. Frankfurt Airport, a few months later. Point of departure for flight number 941, United Airlines daily route to Chicago and Denver, now serviced by 777s. The pilot's day begins in the United Airlines dispatch, a small room behind the check-in desk. Dispatch service personnel provide the pilots up-to-date navigational and meteorological information for the nearly 4,000 nautical mile flight to Chicago. We're joining them on board to judge for ourselves how the 777 shapes up in scheduled commercial service. We're going to 
Yeah, that's our uh, second choice. The captain of the flight is Ron Werner, a seasoned U.S. United Airlines veteran. Having test flown the plane for Boeing, he's among the first pilots to fly the 777. And having also piloted the inaugural Frankfurt to Chicago flight, Ron feels very much at home behind the controls. His co-pilot is Dolores Argenta, who served for several years as pilot on the Boeing 737, among others. A few months ago, she was one of the first women to begin 777 training. Since then, she's been joined by others. Not surprising, considering the high number of women among the 8,500 pilots employed by United. The third member of the flight crew is second officer Michael Hermanson, who's empowered not only to take over the role of captain, but also of co-pilot, <coughs> albeit only at crew's flight. During the long flight, he'll alternatively relieve each of his colleagues from duty. Stipulated by the United States Federal Aviation Authority, or the FAA, regulations governing flying hours pertain to all international flights over eight hours. Under current wind conditions, the flight to Chicago will take approximately nine hours and 45 minutes. There's just one hour to go before takeoff. After the pilots have completed their preparations and dispatch, they make their way to the plane. Since the same cabin and cockpit crews work together on the first leg, no briefing is necessary on this return flight. Rather, they have a short discussion of the main details with the head flight attendant, who passes this information on to her colleagues. Like other airlines, the crew is newly assembled for each assignment. There are two advantages to this. First, it enables flexible deployment of personnel. Secondly, it prevents crew members from becoming too familiar with each other, which could lead to carelessness of strict adherence to standard procedures. The Boeing 777 flying us to Chicago is the first airplane of this type to leave the factory. It bears the motto, working together. It's also been given the characteristic registration, November 777 Uniform Alpha, Boeing 777 United Airlines. While the crew run through the pre-flight checklist in the cockpit, the plane is being refueled. During the briefing and dispatch just minutes earlier, the pilots calculated the quantity of fuel required for the flight and then promptly communicated this information to ground staff. Refueling takes about 30 minutes. At first sight, fuel requirements appear considerable. The 777 is expected to consume nearly 20,000 U.S. gallons during the flight to Chicago. However, a distinguishing feature of today's sophisticated commercial jets, such as the 777, is their surprisingly very low fuel consumption. On a per-passenger basis, this works out to an impressive 62 statute miles per gallon. Compare this, for example, to the Boeing 707, one of the first jets on the transatlantic route. The 707 per passenger got only 40 miles per gallon. In addition to fuel, the Boeing also consumes small quantities of oil. And occasionally one is confronted by the incongruous sight of a mechanic topping off these gigantic high-tech engines with a single can of oil. Inside the Boeing 777, cleaning staff are still at work, ensuring the cabin and all 293 seats are spotless before each flight. As with most major carriers, United Airlines has equipped its long-haul planes with three classes of seating. Customer satisfaction is certainly writ large at this U.S. airline. It's taken as a given that a passenger's experience in the cabin can be the decisive factor in his or her overall satisfaction. Oh, sure. It's, um, it's, I believe it's a 777. Right. What do you know about this aircraft? Just I flew over on it, and it was very pleasant and um, very, very, very clean and um, 
very comfortable and really enjoyed it. I know that it's, uh, um, it's comfortable. Uh, like the uh, video monitors for each seat. Um, there's a little more room. Um, and it's made by Boeing, and that's about it. Uh, we flew over from Chicago, and uh, great movies, great food. Watch the sunrise. It was very nice. On today's flight, the 777 is almost full, with a total of 271 passengers on board. Only 14 seats remain unoccupied in economy class. Less than one half hour before scheduled takeoff. Flight preparations are almost completed. The ground crew stow the last pieces of baggage into the rear of the plane and in the cargo bay. Freight containers are secured into position. With 271 passengers, 17 crew members, and full fuel tanks for the long flight, the 777 is close to its maximum takeoff weight. This limits the number of containers that can be carried. These are standard restrictions for all passenger jets. By the time the cargo bay doors are locked, the Boeing is actually over the maximum 535,000 pound takeoff limit. However, the pilots have factored in the several hundred pounds of fuel that will be consumed by starting the engines and taxiing to the runway. Ten minutes before takeoff, the 777 begins to move. So-called pushback clearance is given by ground control. At the same time, pilots have received clearance to start the engines. Later during the flight, Dolores Argenta explains the startup procedures for the 777. We start both engines at the same time, which is unusual. This is the first airplane, Boeing airplane that we've been able to start both engines at the same time. I turn both switches to start, and then I turn the fuel control switches on. The auto start system monitors the start for us. It adds fuel at the proper time, and any malfunctions or any abnormalities that might come up during the engine start is monitored by the computer and brought to our attention immediately. And if, if it's something that is going to affect the start, Auto start will, will abort the start all by itself. We, we don't have to have manual intervention like on the old airplanes. You would have to physically move the switch and stop the start, but auto start will do it for you on this airplane. Today the crew is allocated takeoff runway 25 right, so the plane only has to taxi a few hundred yards. 25 stands for course 250 degrees, which means that the runway is pointing to the west, requiring only minor course adjustments once airborne. With the prevalent westerly winds in Germany, it's quite common to take off in this direction. On approximately 65% of all days, runway 25 is in use. Takeoffs on other runways, for example the 07 or the 18, are used less often for this route. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. On the ground, the plane is initially piloted by Captain Werner. However, the pilots have already agreed that Dolores Argenta will take over controls for takeoff. We're given clearance for takeoff, and Dolores Argenta pushes the thrust levers forward. This must be done smoothly to ensure the engines don't rev up unevenly, causing the craft to veer off the runway. Only when symmetry is established and the engines are revved up sufficiently is the confirmation takeoff thrust set given. The non-flying pilot then takes control of the thrust levers in order to quickly pull up in case of a problem. Carrying the maximum takeoff weight, 
Triple seven today requires almost 30 seconds to attain the critical velocity V1, signaled by a computer voice. Another new feature for a Boeing. The point of no return is reached. Takeoff must proceed under all circumstances, since there's not enough runway left for the plane to pull up in time. To prevent pilots from instinctively releasing the throttle in the event of, say, engine failure, it's standard procedure to refrain from touching the thrust levers from the point of V1 onwards. Within seconds, takeoff speed is attained. Today, it's 158 knots. The twin engines combine to produce an output of 90,000 horsepower. The 535,000 pound craft rises elegantly into the sky. The November 777 Uniform Alpha is finally airborne. Out of sheer enjoyment, Dolores Argenta decides to pilot the plane manually up to our cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. By that time, the 777 will be almost directly over the English Channel. As we witness how smoothly the Boeing 777 operates in scheduled service, it's hard to understand the dire warnings of some critics regarding the huge twin engines. A number of pilots, for example, expressed concern about being able to control the 777 in the event of engine failure. In this highly improbable worst-case scenario, pilots would have to contend with the 90,000 pounds of thrust of the engine on one side and the air resistance created by the defective engine on the other. Uh, actually, it's not a problem. Uh, it's a, this is a fly-by-wire airplane, the first one that Boeing has, has made. And the fly-by-wire flight controls compensate very well for the engine thrust loss. It's much easier to handle an engine failure on takeoff on this airplane than it is a Boeing 737. Um, there's another piece of equipment that we'll be getting shortly. We don't have it as of yet. but. Uh, sometime next year, we're planning to get what they call a thrust asymmetry computer, which will further help compensate for an engine loss on takeoff or some other high power setting. But even at this point, without the computer, it's very easy to control, much easier than most other airplanes that I've flown in the past. Have you personally had an engine failure so far? No. The engines so far have worked very well. Very pleased with the performance of the engines on this airplane. A further controversial issue surrounding the 777 is the danger of flying over the ocean with only two engines. When the first twin engine jets flew over the Atlantic, this process was called the Extended Range Operating System, or EROPS for short. Cynics renamed this to Engines Running or Passengers Swimming. But this probably has nothing to do with the fact that EROPS has over time evolved into the term ETOPS. Well, ETOPS uh, stands for Extended Two Engine Operations, and to be certified for ETOPS, the aircraft has to establish its reliability as far as the engines and systems, and uh, once the FAA grants the certification, uh, there are some different levels of ETOPS uh, the 777 was a little bit different in the, the way that it was certified for the 180-minute ETOPS from the first day that we put it in service. Normally, airplanes have gone through a period of service in the airlines to establish their reliability, and uh, we did that on this airplane. In fact, the United Pilots had part of that program that we uh, participated in to establish that early before we put it in revenue service. So in operation, what it means is we always have to have a suitable landing airport within that given distance in time.
that should something malfunction that we have a place to land, uh, whereas a three or four engine airplane does not have these requirements. So that is the difference uh, between two engine airplanes over the water and three or more engines. The Boeing 777 was the first plane ever to leave the factory with ETOPS certification for the maximum 180 minute limit. This effectively enables the jetliner to fly to any destination in the world without restriction. Since none of the routes in United Airlines network are at any point more than 180 minutes away from an airfield. On reaching the Atlantic, the pilots change positions. Ron Warner now relaxes in the cabin, signing over his responsibilities to the capable hands of Michael Hermanson for the next few hours. Together with Dolores Argenta, he'll supervise the flight, which now is operating under the so-called oceanic track system. During times of peak traffic, up to eight air corridors are available for most flights each day. In 1995, an average of 680 aircraft flew daily from Europe to North America and vice versa. Three of the corridors available in our route are plotted here in this navigation chart. We're currently flying in Central Corridor, which is marked in yellow. At this moment, we're sharing the same corridor with some 25 other airplanes, located both ahead and behind, at staggered intervals of at least 10 minutes. This system is relatively simple, and provided nothing unusual happens, pilots have relatively little to do. And this gives us a good opportunity to trace the historical development of the Boeing 777. The birthplace of the 777 is Everett, a port city in the state of Washington in the United States. Within these vast hangars, which are among the largest buildings in the world, the 747, 767, and 777 are assembled. Almost daily, a new airplane leaves the Boeing plants. The output for 1996, 250 aircraft. The current average of three and one half 77s each month is scheduled to rise to five per month in 1997. Boeing's longest running bestseller is still the 737. With over 3,000 units already supplied, this is the world's biggest selling jet. And with a further 500 machines currently on order, the success story is guaranteed to continue. Also part of today's Boeing fleet is the 757, designed for medium range flights, and its larger brother, the 767, made for long-haul flights with a range of over 5,500 nautical miles without stopping. The largest plane in the Boeing fleet is still the 747, the jumbo jet, with worldwide sales now topping 1,000. Since its inaugural flight in 1969, the jumbo has undergone further development, spawning a number of variations, and even larger 500 and 600 versions are already being planned. With a maximum capacity of 440 passengers, the 777 will be available in two versions, 
Although the so-called A or B market models will have identical physical dimensions, they'll have different ranges. This animation demonstrates how the 777 fits into Boeing's product range. However, this is only a snapshot of the present situation, as other 777 versions are currently being planned. In May of 1998, we are planning a longer stretched version of this airplane, an airplane that would be meant to uh, replace 747-200 type airplanes. So it would have seating which would be about the same seat count as 747-200s and fly about 747-200 ranges. So it would be a very good transatlantic type of operating airplane. Uh, the third member of that family is a shortened body version of the airplane. So the current airplane you are on would be shortened by approximately uh, 25 feet. And that airplane would be uh, used to fly very, very long ranges, far longer than anything flying in the world today. It would fly about 8,500 miles. Compared to the current 200 version, the longer body 777-300 will be the world's longest passenger jet longer even than the 747. A simple comparison gives some idea of the vast dimensions, even of the 200 version. The 777's engines have almost the same diameter as the 737's fuselage. The 777 is supplied with one of three different engines, all of which were on view at Le Bourget. Rolls-Royce, General Electric, and Pratt & Whitney. In their attempts to secure the prestigious market for very large engines, are waging a fierce battle. And in choosing which one to buy, airline companies have to decide which engine fits best into their total fleet, a key decision, and the engines account for 10% of the jet's total cost. The 777 is currently retailing for about $170 million. For a long time, the Rolls-Royce Trent 800 series was only the second choice for most airlines. But Rolls-Royce's fortunes improved rapidly after a massive order in late 1995 by Singapore Airlines for 77 777s fitted with this engine. With a fan diameter measuring more than 10 feet, the GE90 from General Electric is the largest of the three contenders. The number one customer is British Airways, which has placed an order for 15 777s. Finally, United Airlines opted for the PW4084, built by Pratt & Whitney. This is the first of the three engines granted certification by the FAA. Before being certified, a new engine must undergo a rigorous test program. Fascinating film from Pratt and Whitney demonstrates how the PW4084 was developed and tested. One hundred and twelve inch fan PW4000, the largest and newest derivative from the service proven PW4000 engine family. A design platform backed by millions of hours of service experience. This remarkable engine was developed for more power, easiest maintenance, 
and ETOPS reliability. State-of-the-art design tools were applied along with Pratt & Whitney's unparalleled design experience, refining each component for performance. For fit, for maintainability, for durability, prototype hardware was built and evaluated on rigs such as the fan containment rig. Complete propulsion systems assembled from production hardware were rigorously tested. Cycle after cycle. Often with deliberate imbalance to induce excessive vibration. The 4084 tested well at unprecedented levels. It operated smoothly in a one in a billion chance severity rainstorm. It demonstrated stability in extreme crosswinds. The lightweight Kevlar aluminum containment system demonstrated containment of an entire fan blade with the engine running at speeds for 90,000 pounds of thrust. Strength and stability were demonstrated with the ingestion of four two and a half pound birds. Power loss was less than 1%. Dependable operation proved true in a record-setting five airplane flight test program. Hundreds of flights achieved milestone after milestone towards the goal of 777 certification. With the 4084 proving itself under all kinds of operating conditions, with engine airframe performance meeting or exceeding all design goals. The PW4084 is derivative reliability. Qualifying for 180 minute early ETOPS. Another Pratt & Whitney dependable engine. The PW4084. The rivals, General Electric and Rolls-Royce, also subject their engines to similarly stringent testing. In principle, all three engines are very similar. So a key factor in the decision is the airline's overall fleet policy, 
and the manufacturer's ability to provide solutions within a total package for a whole range of market requirements. Mention's already been made that the development of the 777 and its engines, here a model being tested in the wind tunnel, was very different to that of its predecessors. A crucial factor for airlines was no doubt that at the time of first delivery, the 777 had already been granted full ETOP certification, allowing unrestricted service on all routes. Similarly, in other key aspects of development, Boeing was prepared to take radically new approaches. For example, the 777 was designed on a computer. In addition to reducing paperwork during the design stage, this made it no longer necessary to build a true-to-scale prototype. Up to now, this was needed to ensure the precise fit of all components. For the development of the 777, a digital, three-dimensional model was designed on computer. Using sophisticated software, Engineers were then able to observe all components from various angles and check their fit. Thousands of man hours and thousands of reams of paper were thus saved, cutting development time substantially. According to Boeing, this resulted in a mere 27 months to develop the 777, compared to 40 months for the 767. As the first manufacturer, of passenger aircraft to introduce this revolutionary procedure, Boeing's impressive results attest to the wisdom of this decision. The 777 went into production on time, and in the end, all components fit together perfectly. Altogether, the plane has three million individual parts, including nuts and bolts, of which some 132,000 were specifically manufactured for the 777. Final assembly of the myriad components supplied by a whole range of subcontractors, takes place at Boeing's Everett plant. Here, for example, assembly of the horizontal tail section. Whereas the stabilizer is produced by Boeing itself, the actual elevator comes from the Australian company Hawker de Havilland. The main landing gear is made by a Canadian-French company. The matching gear doors, in contrast, by the Japanese company, Fuji Heavy Industries. And the list goes on. With the installation of the engines, here the Pratt & Whitney PW4084, final assembly is almost complete. It takes between 90 and 120 days to carefully fit all parts together to create an entire airplane. Never before has the traditional rivalry between Boeing and Airbus been so apparent as at the 1995 Aerosalon in Paris. Throughout the show, the Airbus consortium was hard pressed to match the public enthusiasm for the Boeing 777, despite being on its own home turf. However, Airbus still put on an impressive display. And in contrast to the 777, which did not participate in the flying program, Airbus demonstrated daily its rival products, the A340 and the A330. Here we see a slow flyover by the four-engine A340, followed by an A330 during takeoff. Both aircraft have many components in common. For example, an identical fuselage cross-section. The Airbus Industry A330, which you have just seen take off, is a medium to long-range wide body powered by two engines able to carry up to 335 passengers in a standard two-class. 
The unrelenting battle for market share waged between these two manufacturers of civil aircraft is not for the faint-hearted. Amidst mutual accusations of manipulating figures, the rivalry between Airbus and Boeing has sometimes assumed grotesque proportions. For example, the cabin of this particular 777 was fitted with a fuselage cross-section identical to that of their competitors, the A330 and A340. These clients from the Far East are obviously impressed with the greater dimensions of the 777 as they come in for a look at the cabin. With the same size seats, the 777 can carry about 50 more passengers, although for airlines, size alone isn't necessarily a reason to buy. But even in deals of this magnitude, prestige can play a key role, and the high load capacity of this aircraft is a factor Boeing's keen to exploit in its sales pitch. Equally enlightening is to compare the varying cockpit philosophies of Airbus and Boeing. Whereas the Americans take a more conventional approach, the European consortium has established a reputation for pioneering developments in the automation of the cockpit. In 1988, the A320 became the first passenger plane to be controlled by so-called fly-by-wire technology. Dispensing entirely with mechanical connections between the cockpit and the control surfaces and engines, commands are thus transmitted by wires. Airbus has since developed fly-by-wire a stage further and has integrated computers into the circuits. These are programmed, for example, to not accept potentially hazardous commands and to automatically maintain a stable flight status. However, this supposedly foolproof aircraft also has drawbacks. For example, the maximum limit set by the computer can never be overridden by the pilots, not even if this is the only possibility to avoid a collision with another aircraft. The launch of the 777 marks the first Boeing airplane to be equipped with fly-by-wire technology. But Boeing is not interested in creating an automated cockpit like that in the Airbus. Fundamentally, the two companies are, are actually quite similar. But what we do is uh, provide the pilot some capability to make decisions beyond what the computer might decide it should be doing. Now, the first, the first thing is the controller itself. Um, the fly-by-wire control system with the side stick uh, is, is really slightly, uh, well, it's fundamentally different, obviously, in the way it looks. It provides some room in front of the pilot, which is nice. But when we, we were trying to make the decision, do we want to go with a column and wheel, we looked at what is the real benefit. That might be one, to have more space. But the control column and wheel has some history to it as to why it evolved to what it is. One of the things it does is provide feedback to the pilot of, of several things. One is what the other pilot is doing in a two-crew aircraft as opposed to a military single pilot fighter. What the other pilot is doing is displayed to the non-flying pilot by what the controls are moving and doing. Secondly, when the automatic pilot is flying, when neither pilot is actively in the controls, this system allows the autopilot to, to display to the, both pilots that it's commanding a turn or a climb, and it gives you an idea then of how much control is being used to do a certain thing, like how much control is being used to cold wings level. With the side stick uh, display, or the implementation, the controller of the side stick, that's harder to do. I think the, the main philosophy, the main point that you can obviously see in the cockpit is that we have no, the big wheel that was a traditional uh, system on the, the previous aircraft, and we have chosen what's more natural for a fly-by-wire, that's been a, a, a side stick, 
which is a more natural interface with a fly-by-wire uh, aircraft where you don't need big forces to move the aircraft. And with the side stick, you have the possibility to have a table that you can use to write, to, to, to put your map, and that's a big uh, advantage. Do pilots have the possibility to override the computer like in the 777? No, you, you cannot uh, override the, the limit, uh, but the, the limits are put very high. Uh, I would say like, it's like the driving on the road with some uh, lateral uh, uh, guides when you cannot uh, go and uh, uh, get out of the, the road. That was the, the, the solution we, we have chosen. In one essential area, however, Boeing is more automated than Airbus. The checklists are now all programmed in the onboard computer and presented on a so-called multifunction display. The lists are partially checked by the computer automatically. On Airbus planes, however, only the checklists necessary for the flight and emergency procedures are programmed in. For example, the procedure in case of a fire in the auxiliary power unit. The checklist is displayed in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. Clearly, automatic checklists offer considerable benefits and will soon become standard in all aircraft, regardless of manufacturer. The normal checklist that we uh, accomplish using a printed checklist will now be showing on the screen brought up by the checklist uh, prompt. But even more uh, importantly than that, the uh, irregular procedures and emergency procedures will also appear on the electronic checklist. It will allow us to uh, go through the checklist without the possibility of getting on the wrong checklist or missing an item. Uh, so it's, it's going to be a major improvement for us. Uh, we think we'll have that in service early next year. But uh, that's the biggest thing. It will uh, prevent mistakes. So she's from Abbas Industry. In the future, Airbus and Boeing will no doubt continue to go their separate ways, both in terms of cockpit philosophy and other areas. One can eagerly look forward to future developments in this long and intense rivalry. Their respective aircraft will continue a fierce competition in the world market, and airline companies will continue to reap the benefits. We already own a 767, but we need some reinforcement for the routes to Australia, so it comes down to a straight choice between the Boeing 777 and the Airbus 340. Lauda Air finally decided on the 777, ordering two planes with an option on another two. Informed sources say that the Australian Airlines' decision was in part influenced by a preference for the 777's cockpit design. United Airlines has been beating the drum for the 777. Hardly surprising in view of the fact that the U.S. airline will own one of the largest fleets of 777s, 
having ordered a total of 34 and holding an option on a further 34. The fleet size is exceeded only by Singapore Airlines, which recently signed a huge deal for 77 planes, totaling $12.7 billion. Within United Airlines' network, the 777 will fly existing routes, previously serviced by older planes, such as the DC-10. This will result in considerable environmental and economic benefits, since the 777 consumes some 30% less fuel than its predecessor. On the other hand, with experts forecasting increasing growth in air traffic volume worldwide, the 777 will also be used on newly opened routes. With experts expecting an annual growth rate of 5%, the 777 is ideally placed to meet future challenges in air travel. With 559 jetliners, United commands one of the largest fleets in the world and will continue to expand in the coming years. By virtue of its ambitious fleet policy, the U.S. carrier is confident of remaining the largest carrier in the world in terms of number of passengers. In 1995, over 75 million people flew with United Airlines. And this leading market position is being reinforced by entering into partnerships with other carriers. For example, in 1994, United and Lufthansa forged an alliance which sent shockwaves throughout the industry. United plans to meet this expected increase in passenger volume via two key hubs in the United States. The first is Chicago's O'Hare, which in terms of number of flights is the largest airport in the world. Here it's not uncommon for five aircraft to make their final approaches all in the same landing direction and all at the same time. On average, there's a flight coming or going every 35 seconds on one of seven runways. This amounts to between 2,300 and 2,400 takeoffs or landings each day. In order to process passengers smoothly and efficiently despite growing traffic volumes, a new terminal was put into operation in 1988. Now used exclusively by United and Lufthansa, it's regarded as one of the most beautiful of its kind in the world. The other hub is located about a thousand miles farther west in Denver, Colorado. Opened in 1995, this international airport has also attracted its share of plaudits and superlatives. In terms of surface area, the airport is among the largest in the world, and it has 